Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We're uh, starting a little bit behind, but we're going to make it up and end on time. So as you're hearing the presentations, if you would be thinking about your questions so you can ask very pointed and concise questions rather than doing like we like to do and give speeches. So um, I, I give you that as an assignment to help us get back on track time-wise on that. We, uh, we, we're glad nothing was taken away from our luncheon speaker because he had a great message for us. Welcome to the Texas Public Policy Foundation Policy Orientation for 2016. Wow, I can't believe it's 2016. They're back, back a few years ago. I thought I'd be lucky if I lived to be to 2010. And here I am six years later and still alive. I don't know what the deal is, but I'm glad of it. Anyway, thank you so much for being here. We've got a great panel for you. And we're going to talk about the Texas budget, conservative budget. Is the conservative budget or can a conservative budget serve the needs of Texans? We believe it can. We look back a few years back in 2011, short money, did some cutting, but also did some delaying. Came back 2013 and saw the controller had missed the number a little bit. There was actually more money coming in than what she thought it would. Um, and so when you saw what had been appropriated in 2011 and what was appropriated in 2013 and the supplemental to take care of what wasn't appropriated in 2011 and what was appropriated in 2013, we found that from appropriation to appropriations, was a 26% increase. Now, that wasn't an increase in the budget. They stayed within the, the spending limit that they had uh, before them. But we decide, we believe that a good budget, a conservative budget, is one that stays within the parameters population plus inflation. So in July, we put a number out of 20, uh, 14 and said you should not have more uh, uh, an increase greater than population inflation and looking back two years that was we figured about six and a half percent so we put that marker out there and I, I don't know whether it was because of our suggestion uh, because of some campaign promises that were made probably a combination of those uh, and when they came in and started talking about the budget they talked more about how much can we cut taxes instead of spending, and we ended up not spending 6.5% uh, more, but all funds 3.6% more, which proved the point that you can stay, keep all funds, that's including federal funds, within population inflation. And we believe that the legislative body of 2015 did write a conservative budget. Now the question is, is that budget likely to serve the people of Texas in an appropriate way? And that's part of what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, you may say, no, we need more here, or yes, uh, it, it's okay, or no, it's still too much. But we want to explore that today to see what if we continue to keep all funds within population and inflation, will it serve the people of Texas in an appropriate way, the way they should be served by their government? So we have with us today a fine panel that starts out with uh, Mr. Bob Williams. President of the State Budget Solutions, founder and senior fellow of the Freedom Foundation. He has a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration from Pennsylvania State University. Uh, well, he overcame it. Worked as a, a GAO auditor in the Pentagon and post office before moving up. 
Boy, I, you know, if I looked at what Bob has done and what he's doing now, I would have never guessed he worked for the post office based on the kind of service we get sometimes from them. Uh, he served five terms in the Washington State Legislature, and he currently is a private sector chair of ALEC Tax and Fiscal Policy Task Force. Please help me welcome Bob Williams. Thank you, Talmadge. And just a reminder, when I audited the Pentagon, I was an auditor at the Pentagon for the GAO. But nothing in the experience of auditing the Pentagon and the post office prepared me for the budget when I became a state legislator in Washington State. Now, this is so long ago, Talmadge can recall this. We didn't have computers in those days. But let me first talk about why the state budget is the most important piece or pieces of legislature that you face in the legislature. My top recommendation is every legislator should be involved in the budget process. And one of the lessons I learned early on is no governor can veto a zero item in the budget. And let me tell you, as a sophomore, I got the governor's attention when I vetoed, zeroed out one of his agencies. And I got a note shortly after that, the governor's waiting in your office. I said, well, he can wait till the meeting's over. But that's where you negotiate. What is a conservative budget? <clears throat> The Texas 2016-17 budget is a conservative budget. The governor passed, let me see, the legislature passed and the governor signed a budget increase of less than the population growth plus inflation. Will that meet the need of Texans? You know, there's a big difference between the needs of Texans and the desires or wants of Texans. I want to praise Talmadge and Texas Public Policy for its leadership on this issue and the work of the Texas Budget Coalition. You know, Texas recently was ranked number 13th in budget transparency. That's a good rating, but there's a lot more to do. Past budgets weren't. Talmadge briefly mentioned the 2011 budget, and we were very, very critical of Governor Perry in the 2011 budget because there were so many gimmicks in that budget. One of the gimmicks was to delay the payment of K-12 for one day and put it into next fiscal year. And, to assume some realist, unrealistic revenue forecast, et cetera. Uh, <clears throat> there's a recent report out that came out last month from the Volcker Alliance, and I urge all legislators to get a copy of the Volcker Alliance one on budget transparency. It talks about what needs to be done to improve it, to get rid of kicking the can forward, or to fully disclose when you kick the can forward in terms of that. Why is a conservative budget important? <laughs> That's a good reason, good question. Well, as a legislator, I found out in Washington State in 10 years, trying to get the legislators, my colleagues, to look at the total state spending was difficult. They just went to look at Journal Fund State. Do you know that one third, nearly one third of your budget comes from the federal government? Do you really believe that's gonna continue in the future? The Government Accountability Office, where I used to work, does an annual report in state and local government fiscal outlook. Legislators, this is a wake-up call. Their December 2015 report indicates that closing the long-range fiscal gap of state and local government spending will require action to be taken today and maintained every year until 2058, 2058, equivalent to a 5% reduction in state and local government spending or a combination of a 5% reduction or a 5% increase in taxes. The December 15th report from the National Association of State Budget Office projects that state revenue growth will slow down in this fiscal year. It's projected to increase by only 2.5%, down from the 4.8% growth in fiscal 2015. Rising Medicaid expenditures and the fact that the state will soon have to pick up a larger share of Medicaid expenditures should again be a wake-up call for the legislature. Let me mention again a NASBO report, National Association of State Budget Offices, said total state spending last fiscal year increased at its fastest rate since 1992. Do you expect that to continue? But the big increase was Medicaid, and particularly those states that did the Medicaid expansion. Another reason why a conservative budget is necessary is because of your rising pension costs. 
Now, State Budget Solutions disagrees with how the administration and how the legislature shows the pension liability. We believe in market-based. Your pension unfunded liability is much greater. Also, a state conservative budget shows the state is working to reduce the size and cost of government, it keeps taxes lower, and improves the economic climate of the state. In Alex's latest Rich States, Four States report, Texas rose from the ranking of 13th in the previous year to 11th in the current report. Spending limits are a key part and will be discussed in a panel tomorrow. And a conservative budget supports the needs of the state and upholds economic prosperity. With that as a background, let me say what needs to be done to improve a conservative Texas budget. One is I strongly recommend that the Texas legislature do a financial ready Texas similar to what Utah did. This would be to identify all the federal funds that are coming into the state and particularly to identify all the maintenance of effort or other paperwork requirements. You'll find in some cases that maybe you shouldn't be going after some of the federal funds because it's costing you more than the funds you're receiving. And develop a contingency plan for a 5% and a 25% cutback in federal funds. Second, have more legislative hearings on the current budget and the current outcomes. For example, if I were a legislator today, I would not give any more money to K-12 or higher education. It's past time for us to get more education for the money already invested. It's past time to reduce the number of non-teaching staff in K-12. It's past the time for us to look at higher education and instead of funding institutions of higher education, fund the students. In my state, I won't pick on Texas, in Washington state, two of our four-year schools, after six years, less than 50% of the kids graduate. Now imagine that student loan. But nationwide, last year, 50% of the college, grad college graduates are either underemployed or unemployed. There's something wrong in the system. Have a legislature determine five to seven core functions of government, and now the next step's the key. Require all state programs to go into those five or seven programs, and we did this in Washington State, and it's amazing what happens and then require the budget office working with the agencies to prioritize the programs, one-third high, one-third medium, and one-third low. Now, once the legislature holds hearings on that, they'll find out that many of the high-priority programs are deemed low-priority, and the low-priority ones are deemed high because they don't think you're going to look at them <laughs> in terms of that. Provide budget information, and Talmadge has recommended this for years, in near real time through the budget process. This should ex include the state expenditures by fund or account and expenditures by agency program and sub-program. State agency workload, caseloads, and outcome performance measures. You have some great outcome performance measures, but the problem is the legislature doesn't hold enough hearings to say, how is that money being used this year? What are we doing on the outcomes? Next, Texas should adopt a 72-hour timeout before any budget's voted on. It should be on the web so the public and legislators can look at the budget before they vote on it. Reform the state spending limit, and you'll have more on that tomorrow, so I won't go into that in detail. Legislators need to take a hard look at innovative budget savings programs in other states. I mentioned fund the student at the college in higher ed, fund the student in K-12, reduce the amount of K-12 funds not going to the classroom, reduce or eliminate your perverse incentives in the budget. In Washington State, when I was a legislator, we had um, a program called remediation, and that became politically incorrect, so they changed it to learning assistance program. The only thing about learning assistance program, it was LAP, it lapped up the money. Because school districts found out the more people they could put in the lap, the learning assistance program, the more money they would get. And they weren't healed. It was a money gathering thing. Provide more hand up rather than handouts. Look at competitive bidding. Many of the support services that you provide in K-12 in higher ed could go out for competitive bid and have serious pension reform. And legislators, if I don't say anything else, give local government the ability to control their own pensions. You have a couple cities, i.e. Houston, that are gonna be bankrupt pretty soon unless you allow them to control their own destiny. And if they control their own destiny and they put themselves into bankruptcy, that's fine. But if you give them no control and they go over the hill, then it's your burden.
Thank you, Bob. Our next speaker is one of the uh, House of Representatives members who has uh, served since 2006, Representative Donna Howard. She's a member of the House Appropriations Committee and sits on its Article Three subcommittee, which oversees education, spending, and the state budget. She's a long-term member of the House Higher Education Committee and currently serves as vice chairman of that committee and also on the House Administration Committee. Representative Howard earned a bachelor's degree in nursing and a master's degree in health education from the University of Texas. Please welcome State Representative Donna Howard. Thank you, Talmadge. Um, thank you all for having us today. I think it's pretty clear that I'm here to offer kind of a different perspective, perhaps, than you might be hearing from some, um, and I intend to do that. Um, one of the things, though, that I think we've been talking about for quite a while now, and in fact, on previous panels that I have served on with TPPF, um, we've talked about uh, this way of looking at the growth of the budget and what the metric should be that we base that on and continually hear uh, inflation plus population growth. And I, I thought we had already corrected that to say that that's really not an accurate mathematical computation for getting at the growth. And I believe that at the last panel last year, I think we were finally at a point where we were saying it's, it's, you need to multiply those factors to get the, the correct figure. If you want to really look at the compounding effect of population growth and inflation, the more accurate way to do that is to multiply, not add. But we continue to hear population plus inflation. And the reason I bring that up is because I believe we can have some real substantive discussions and debates about what we want our budget to look like and what it should be funding and how it should be accountable. But we need to be coming from a position of having um, similar data that we can all agree upon, that we can come from the same base. It makes it very difficult, I think, to have these discussions when we're using different metrics, different computations, different ways at, at getting at these figures. So I'm going to use, when I talk about this, I'm going to use the computation that the Legislative Budget Board uses that uh, looks at the growth over time uh, adjusted for the compounding of population growth and inflation. And there's an important distinction there because you get different numbers. You get different outcomes when you do it that way. I have the piece of paper that you all have on your chairs. I was just looking at it real quickly before we got started here. And I think Talmadge alluded to some of this as well that uh, in all funds this last budget that we just passed increased by 3.6% and state funds 5.8%. When you look at that over time, when you look at that over the past 10-year uh, cycle, that includes those two years, and you adjust it for population growth and inflation, all funds actually have gone, will go down, have gone down and will go down 5.5%. And the state fund increase is only 1.4%. My point being that the controls we have in place now, the constitutional limits, the spending limit, the pay-as-you-go limits, those kinds of things that we have four in our Constitution, they're working pretty well right now. We have controls in place that are keeping us in a position of absolutely staying on course and not uh, going out of bounds, not spending prolifically. We certainly can't with our pay-as-you-go limit. We can only spend what we bring in. We are constitutionally limited to do that, and we don't ever approach that. So for instance, this last session, this last budget that we passed, we did have tax cuts, and that was something that was very much on the front burner for a lot of legislators. Some of the arguments, I think, about doing it, clearly we came in with a surplus and that I think signaled that discussion. Um, but we also needed to look at our overall budget. I know that uh, we were just hearing about the fact that we need to look at the whole budget 
the whole picture here, and I totally agree with that, and I also totally agree with the transparency part. We need to know what we're talking about here. But we came in with a budget that has parts in it, some of the gimmicks that were referred to, but it, more than a gimmick, I guess you could say a counting mechanism, such as using the, uh, the GER dedicated funds to help certify the budget, which has been a long-standing practice. And thanks to Speaker Strauss and the leadership of Chairman Otto and Chairman Darby, we've been whittling away at that for the past several sessions. And in fact, now have it down to about, I think it's a, a little over $3 billion that we're using of dedicated funds to help certify the budget. Funds that we're taking in for one purpose, not spending it that on, that on that purpose, and yet holding it back to certify the budget. We're whittling that away, and I think that's a very positive thing. I think that's a move in the right direction for a real and honest budget, and I would suggest that's a conservative move as well, to not leave certain bills unpaid, so to speak. Um, we had the opportunity with some of our surplus to buy that down further. That was also a choice we could have made. The amount of money that came out in the tax cuts of about $4 billion could have been used instead to get us on uh, in an honest place with our budget where we were not using GRD to certify our budget. That was a choice we could have made. That was a discussion that we could have had, and I would suggest that would have actually been the more conservative thing to do, actually make sure we paid our bills, actually make sure that we were using funds that we were bringing in from taxpayers on their intended purpose. That, to me, sounds like a responsible thing to do, which, by the way, I would like to suggest that we look at this not as a liberal or conservative budget as much as I would like to look at it as a responsible budget. What is a responsible budget? And I, I get confused again as I look at things here about what the bottom line is. Is there a bottom line? What is the magic number that says that our budget is conservative enough? What is the magic number that says we're spending as little as possible? Where is that? How do we determine that? I, I still don't know exactly what that is. If we use the, the numbers that were in uh, TPPF's printout, I don't think it's the one that's on your, your chair today, but that looked at what I say is a, is a miscalculation of inflation plus population growth as opposed to the compounding multiplier. I believe that what it said, Talmadge, was something to the tune of $17 billion that we could have spent that much less if we were using that metric. If you look at the discretionary funding that we have in the budget, we only have discretion over between 10 to 20 percent of our budget. The rest are monies that are statutorily, constitutionally dedicated, whatever, federal funds. If you looked at the 14-15 budget, it, the part we had discretion over was about $17 billion. That would have taken everything, everything out of the budget that we had discretion over. I'm still not clear on where those parts are that we need to eliminate, get rid of, or reduce so much. We have already cut public education spending, and we can have debates and discussions about the uh, merits of the programs that we're funding, and I think those are legitimate and valid discussions to have. But we have 31% of our school districts in this state that are still receiving, at this point in time, in the 16-17 budget, are still receiving less than they were in 2011. 31% of the school districts in this state. I find it hard to believe that anyone could look at that and indicate that we are adequately funding our schools. When the decision was made for those cuts in 2011, no one that I remember was saying anything about we need to cut the funds because the schools are spending too much. We were all bemoaning the fact that we had to cut the funds because we didn't have enough money coming in and we were in a shortfall situation. So here we are now with the ability, as we've had over time, to replace those funds and we have not been able to do that. So, indeed, I would suggest that the budget is not adequate. Actually, when you get into this and you think about some of the things that are being proposed here, it seems to me that we're almost irrelevant 
that maybe what the bottom line is, is that we no longer need legislators. We just have whatever the bottom line number is, we plug it in and out comes the amount of money that can be spent on each of the different programs. And maybe some people would prefer that, you know, the old joke of Texan, Texas legislature meeting for uh, whatever it is, 140 days every two years, instead we should meet for two days every 140 years. You've probably heard that one. And I realize that's the attitude some people have. But the fact is that we are elected to make these decisions and hopefully to make them based on an understanding of what the needs are of this state and be good stewards of the taxpayer dollars. There were decisions made that some would label as conservative in this last budget. There was a decision made actually in 2011 to not take federal funds for the Texas Women's Health Program and instead to fund that with totally with state dollars. That was a decision that was made that some would say was conservative. It was an ideological decision. It had a real impact on our budget though. It was a decision that was made that has actually increased state expenditures. And here we are in 2016 and we are seeing 30,000 fewer women than we saw in 2011 and we're paying more money as a result of that. And if you use the LBB's figures where they extrapolate the pregnancies that are not being prevented because we are not serving the clients, then we're adding additional Medicaid costs in the terms of millions of dollars to our taxpayers. Because we had a program that we didn't want to take the federal money, so we increased state dollars, state taxpayer dollars to cover a program that is seeing 30,000 fewer women this many years later than it was at that time and costing us not only the state share of those dollars but the state share of the Medicaid costs to pay for the, uh, for the pregnancies that would have been prevented otherwise. We had the border security issue. The House proposed a lower number than was in the ultimate budget that came out of the Senate. We, I think Dr. Bond and I were, were we, we were both on the fiscal impacts of the border security, yes. And what we found in trying to determine accountability of the state, uh, the taxpayer dollars here, is that we did not have good metrics. We were being told that it was successful when there were more arrests. Then we were told it was successful because there were fewer arrests. Either they were arresting more and that meant it was successful, or they were deterring it and nobody was being arrested and that, not nobody, fewer were being arrested, and that was successful. Without good metrics, we still ended up with a, a decision among some that some would say is conservative that increased the border security funding to $800 million without good metrics. Uh, Chairman Otto proposed legislation that didn't pass that would have allowed us to use some of our one-time economic stabilization fund, rainy day fund money to pay off unfunded liabilities, to help us pay down our debt. That also seemed like a very conservative and responsible approach to take, and yet we couldn't do that. So my point being here, when you start using conservative and maybe liberal or whatever, you start getting into a variety of nuances of how we approach the budget. I would suggest that all of us, Talmadge and myself, could probably have a fairly substantive discussion about what we think about this budget, and we could do it in a way that I think looks at what's responsible here. Not what's conservative, not what's liberal, what's a responsible thing to do, but we need to have a common framework within which to work. We need to have common acceptance and understanding of what we're gonna be basing these decisions on, what the metrics should be. So uh, I, I know I'm probably rambling a lot here. There's probably a lot more we could have uh, in general discussion. Uh, uh, there's a lot of things I'd like to bring up that I probably will just uh, stop now before I get myself into too much trouble. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. I think we can have some good discussion. I think we need to be clear about what it is, the expectations are, the goals are here, what the bottom line is, because if you look over time at the Texas state budget, there's no way anyone I think, could say that this is a runaway budget 
with profligate spending of any kind. This is a budget that is very conservative in terms of the amount of dollars being expended. This is a budget that is not uh, uh, superseding uh, population growth uh, times inflation. This is, this is a budget that is eking by, not fully funding our public education system, not fully funding health care access, and we will pay for it one way or another. We're paying for it with our local property taxes, with the local taxes that have to come into place to pick up the slack of what's not being funded by the state. And if you're really interested in property tax reduction, which I am and certainly my constituents are, we pay some of the highest in the state in my district. If we're interested in reducing those, the only way to do that on any long-term basis is to replace some of those funds with state revenue. That's the only way to do it. And contrary to what some people believe happened in 2006-07 with the uh, property tax swap of that time, may not have been done in the right way. I don't think a lot of us would have done this uh, again, going back and looking at what happened. But at the same time, when you reduce property taxes by a third, that is a huge, as I said, $14 billion swap of, of money, of taxpayer money. It's coming from a different place. It wasn't seen by most taxpayers because their property appraisals went up. If they hadn't had that tax swap, I can't even imagine what would have happened. So the fact is we can make a difference. We can have a state put in more of the funds. We can reduce the property tax burden that way, but clearly there's all these other issues of the appraisal system. I'm not even going to get into that. I think I'll stop. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We'll talk. <laughs> Thank you, Donna. You know, some of you might wonder why we kind of want the other side brought out, but we try not to come up here and talk to ourselves. We try to have both sides, sometimes three sides, to any issue because we know that if you don't hear all uh, opinions and sides, you don't have a chance to grow and to, uh, uh, and to learn from one another. Our final speaker is State Representative Greg Bonin, elected to the Texas House of Representatives in November 2012. After finishing his medical education with high honors, Representative Dr. Bonin, I never know what to call representative or doctor, uh, because I, I, quite frankly, if I have a brain problem, I want the doctor to fix it, not the representative <laughs> on that. <laughs> so, uh, but Representative Bonin <laughs> completed his residency in neurosurgery and uh, served as an assistant professor at UTMB before founding the Texas Brain and Spine Center. Appointed to the House Appropriations Committee and its subcommittee on general government, Public Safety, Criminal Justice, and the Judiciary for the 81st, 4th session. Has served on the Appropriations Committee and the House Committee on Insurance since 2013, following the 84th legislative session, was named a courageous conservative by the Texas Conservative Coalition and an effective conservative by the Conservative Roundtable of Texas. Please rep uh, welcome Representative Greg Bonham. Thank you, Talmadge. You know, Texas has a, a very wise and disciplined budget that serves this state very well. Uh, this is a credit to the people of Texas who had the wisdom to place into our Constitution the requirement that expenditures do not exceed revenues, as well as limits on the debt and the growth of our state spending. Now, this still leaves open room for debate concerning wise and efficient use of available state resources and the possibility of improving upon or refining the constitutional parameters that we currently have in place. The 2016-2017 budget is 3.6% larger than the previous biannual budget, 
that growth is less uh, than the growth in state population factored for population, Representative Howard. Uh, the budget is $209.4 billion in all funds, uh, which includes $106.6 .6 billion in general revenue. Uh, and that's a 12% increase from the 2014-2015 biennium uh, in respect to general revenue. Um, at a growth rate of 4% per year, this $209 billion budget would become about $340 billion in 20 years. By comparison, at a growth rate of 7% uh, a year, uh, the budget would grow to about $500 billion in 20 years. And the point is simply that small increments over time make a very large difference. Uh, the budget that passed this session does provide significant funding in several key areas. Uh, public education, there are $42.3 billion, all funds, for public education through the Foundation School Program. Uh, this is an increase of $2.8 billion. The state spends more general revenue, $32 billion, on public education than any other single item in the budget. This is important because it is a reflection of the critical importance that we place on education in the state of Texas. It has been said that if you want to know what people value, look at their checkbook. And if you look at the state of Texas, we have placed our highest value on education. At the same time, we must be careful not to buy into the narrative that quality and performance are singularly related and directly proportional to spending. Uh, innovation, competition, and fostering a culture that truly values learning are critical to success. Now, funding for higher education also increased substantially, uh, approximately 7.5%, which is $1.5 billion. Uh, additionally, there were $3.1 billion in tuition revenue bonds that were approved for higher education campus infrastructure. And uh, I believe this was probably the most requested item from the higher education uh, community. In the area of border security, which is of great concern to most Texans, $800 million was appropriated to fund 250 new DPS troopers, a 10-hour statewide work week, or, or work day, excuse me, for all troopers statewide, uh, and then grants for local law enforcement agencies. Transportation infrastructure has been a large focus uh, of each of the last two legislative sessions. The 84th legislature allocated $1.75 billion in Proposition 1 revenue, uh, which is oil and gas severance tax revenue, and that's a strategy that had uh, been initiated by the 83rd legislature. Uh, and this is, of course, to decrease congestion and increase connectivity. In addition to that, $1.3 billion in diversions from the State Highway Fund were ended. Now, SJR 5, which is the recently passed Proposition 7, does a couple of things. It reserves $2.5 billion annually from state sales tax revenues uh, in excess of $28 billion, and that begins in fiscal year 2018. Also, uh, in Prop 7, there's a reserve of 35% of the state motor vehicle sales tax revenue above $5 billion that will go to the state highway fund beginning in the uh, 2020 fiscal year. Now, combined, these strategies will place over $5 billion a year in revenue into the state highway fund. Uh, this also represents a pivot, if you will, away from the use of bonds and toll roads to a pay-as-you-go strategy for increasing highway capacity. The legislature has made a major commitment to increasing road capacity in this state, and now we must ensure that this very large increase in revenue into the state highway fund is used efficiently and effectively. The current budget also addresses the needs of the teacher's retirement system, and it makes significant strides to bring the employee retirement system into actuarial uh, soundness by increasing the state and the employee's contributions uh, to the fund. It significantly increases the state's investment in mental health funding by about $244 million, and also regional trauma funding, which was uh, a critical need that we heard about this session, and that was $246 million. It should be noted that Medicaid is $63 billion, all funds, in this budget, $26 billion in general revenue. And as a percent of the budget, Medicaid has grown from approximately 20% 15 years ago to over 29% of the total budget today. That would be all funds. Uh, in terms of general revenue, for comparison's sake, so this would be state general revenue, Article 3, which is public education and higher education together, outpaces Article 2, which is health and human services, 
by 52 billion uh, versus 33 billion dollars. But when you look at all funds within the budget, Article 2, the health-related spending, is now larger than Article 3, education spending, and that's 79 billion compared to 77 billion dollars. Uh, now this budget also provides significant uh, tax and fee relief, and it does increase our commitment to greater transparency. Now good tax policy should be fair, and it should encourage, uh, not stifle productivity in personal industry, which is key to the expansion of our, our economy. Uh, the franchise tax rate was cut by 25% and the million dollar small business exemption was retained and that uh, totaled about $2.6 billion in tax relief. The homestead exemption increases uh, by $10,000 providing another $1.3 billion uh, in this time in the form of property tax relief. There was a $200 uh, annual filing fee for uh, dozens of professions and this was eliminated and combined that's about $250 million uh, in reduction in fees. This budget also continues the priority, which you've already heard about, of spending dedicated funds toward the purpose for which they were collected. And we further reduced uh, the balance of these funds by nearly a billion dollars, with the ultimate goal of completely eliminating our use of unextended, unexpended balances and general revenue dedicated funds for the purpose of budget certification. Now looking forward, uh, in January of 2015, the Comptroller's biannual revenue estimate stated the legislature would have about $113 billion of general revenue for general purpose spending. The BRE also estimated that the ending balance of the Economic Stabilization Fund would be about $11.1 billion. In October, the Comptroller issued his certification revenue estimate, revising the estimate available for general purpose spending downward to $110.3 billion and leaving uh, an ending balance of about $4.1 billion. Of that $4.1 billion, by the way, $3.5 billion uh, is in general revenue uh, dedicated fund balances. Uh, the CRE also revised the ending balance of the ESF downward to $10.4 billion, which is a reflection, of course, of the declining uh, price in oil and natural gas. So states with a very robust energy industry are going to face a major budgetary challenge in the future, but Texas, with our very diverse economy, uh, combined with a very conservative budget from the 84th legislature and a large beginning balance, should be able to absorb the reduction in projected revenues. And, and the key point is that in just a few months since we adjourned and finished this budget, the wisdom of not spending all of the money and providing tax relief to an economy that is cooling is on full display. Uh, there are some uh, who have questioned the need to leave $4 billion in the Treasury, but there are signs of cooling of the Texas economy that could impact the revenue outlook for the next legislative session. Uh, Texas November unemployment stood at 4.6%, which is uh, significantly below the U.S. average. However, this is up from a low of 4.1% just last August. Texas's monthly job growth remains positive. Um, however, it has decreased significantly uh, from where it was just one year ago. Oil and gas rigs operating in Texas in this past November, uh, which was about 339, is nearly a third of the level that we had in November of 2014, which was 904. West Texas Intermediate averaged about $42 a barrel in November and that's well below the average price in November of 2014, which was $75.80. And perhaps even more importantly, it's below the CRE estimate for fiscal year 16 of $49.48. Additionally, the sales tax collections in uh, this past November were 3.3% less than November of 2014, and that was the second straight month of negative sales tax collections. Additionally, the next legislature is going to be faced with some significant spending demands. Some of these fit within historic patterns. We typically add about 85,000, excuse me, um, yeah, about 85,000 additional students to our public schools each year. In addition to that, Medicaid caseload and cost growth are expected to continue to increase. There's also litigation pending on uh, therapy uh, rate reductions for pediatric acute care therapy. And that means the $370 million in cost containment savings that was anticipated in House Bill 1 will quite likely not materialize. 
Uh, now, Texas has seen personal income growth remain strong relative to the rest of the country, and that's great, of course, uh, but this will likely result in a less favorable FMAP rate, and so looking at 2017 and beyond, uh, state revenue will likely compose a greater percentage of Medicaid expenditures. The state also faces the potential of an adverse ruling in the school finance lawsuit, and the potential cost to the state could vary significantly, just depending on the timing the ex and the extent of an adverse ruling. We also have a special master now overseeing the state's foster care system uh, for an undetermined period of time, and the cost of bringing that system into compliance with the court's uh, ruling uh, could be significant. Finally, the uh, TRS, uh, or Teacher's Retirement System uh, Care, faces a potential shortfall of about two billion dollars by the end of 2019, which means the next legislature will need to either make another significant increase in appropriations or make adjustments to the plan design uh, or both. So it bears repeating that the wisdom of not spending all of the money uh, at a time of relative surplus and providing tax relief to an economy that is clearly slowing down uh, is in the best interest of this state. Paying your bills is not the same as purchasing everything that is on your wish list, and the two most definitely should not be conflated. Texas does a much better job of paying its bills than most other states, and a dramatically better job than the federal government. You know, discipline is choosing what you want most over what you want now. And I want a very prosperous future for all Texans, and I think everyone here with us today can uh, agree on that. Uh, and that means a state where every individual has the opportunity to live the American dream and to make a better life for themselves and for their families. And with a disciplined and fiscally responsible approach to budgeting, with public policy that rewards personal responsibility and productivity and protects personal liberty, Texas will continue to be the land of opportunity within the land of opportunity. And uh, I look forward to more conversations about public education with Representative Howard. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Bonham. Uh, do, do either of the panelists have any questions of each other about something that uh, you may have heard Representative Bonham? Yeah. Not, I don't know if this is, hello. Yeah, we're on. I don't know if it's as much of a question as maybe a, uh, an observation or a comment. Um, you know, we heard that 31% of the districts in the state are still not receiving the same level of funding that they did prior to the budget cuts in uh, 2011. And, and I think we have to understand it's a little bit more complex than what might uh, just be initially taken from that observation. Uh, implied in that easily could be that there is simply a lot of funding that has not been placed back into public ed. But when you drill down into what happened, what you see is that the strategies that were used to execute the reduction in funding uh, had multiple variables. And so then when funds were put back into public education, they were not put back in in the exact same mechanism. Uh, and the result of that is that you end up with something that looks different than what you began with. So specifically, there was a, a regular program adjustment factor, which was simply a fair way of uh, equally reducing the basic allotment for all public schools uh, across the board. Uh, when we restored much of the funding, we eliminated that regular program ad adjustment factor. It's gone. But in addition to that, uh, there are schools that uh, are receiving what we uh, call ACETAR funding. And uh, basically these are, are schools that when, we, when the state compressed the, uh, the property tax rates by a third, they were placed on what's known as target revenue, which meant they were, they were told that they would get the same amount of revenue they had in the 2005-2006 school year or what they would have had to, in 2006-2007. Uh, and so if formula funding didn't accomplish that, then they would receive this additional state aid for tax reduction. So just as the basic allotment was reduced by a factor, ACETAR was reduced by uh, to, to about 92.5%, I think. When the money was put back in, it was not put back in to ACETAR, uh, except for a very small percentage increase. And so basically, the 31% of districts 
um, are for the most part more property wealthy districts and they represent about 16 percent of the students in the state so the, the the key bottom line would be that money was placed back in but it was intentionally placed back in in such a way as to do more to help the districts that had less property wealth and the, the goal ultimately actually is to eliminate the target revenue system and, and ACETAR. And I, I, I certainly appreciate where Representative Howard is coming from. Uh, she represents Austin ISD, which um, you may not know, sends more money back to the state uh, in gross dollars uh, of recapture, about $100 billion a year than any other district in the more state of, in, of Texas. So yeah, perhaps more than I? that now. Yeah. May I? Sure. <laughs> and you're, uh, Absolutely right, if you followed all of that. Uh, the fact is, it is very nuanced, and there's a lot more to it, and clearly that's what the point is I was trying to make in terms of us having these kinds of discussions. I think we have to have those kinds of more in-depth, layered, nuanced discussions about uh, anything that revolves around the budget. The fact is, as uh, Representative Dr. Bonin said, uh, the money was put back in differently than it was taken out, and he's absolutely correct that there was a, a strategic and purposeful decision there that most of us got on board with that said, we have this much of a gap between the, those that have the most amount of money per student and those that have the least. Let's address this in such a way that we decrease that gap. And that was a purposeful decision that, as I said, we, most of us all bought into and, and did, even to the detriment of my own constituents who are in a position to not benefit from that, but it was the right thing to do for Texas. At the same time, we don't want to leave behind those school districts that are not getting replacement dollars, such as Austin. And let me just tell you, not only does Austin send the most money back to the state, in fact, it's going up to about $273 million this next year. Austin has 60% of its kids on free and reduced lunch, which is our determinant of poverty. We have some of the largest uh, numbers of, of students who are uh, low income, who are limited English speaking, and yet we are sending back our local property tax taxes that we're taking in from local property taxpayers here back to the state to help cover the costs uh, in other districts that don't have the property wealth that Austin has. So I agree that is much more nuanced and, and there's many more layers to it. But I will still contend that with 31% of our districts not receiving what they received in 2011, that that is not adequately funding all of our school districts. I am very pleased that some of our districts are getting more than they got and we are decreasing that gap. But at the same time, school districts like Austin also need to be uh, restored to what they were previously getting. Oh, wait, well, I'm sorry, one more thing. Sure, go ahead. Before I give this up and I don't get a chance again. The, the tax cuts, I wanted to just make sure I mentioned in regard to the uh, school finance litigation and the fact that we very likely will be put in a position of having to find more funding for public schools. I think most of us agree that, that that's probably going to be the outcome of the case. The tax cuts that came out of this session, the margin tax uh, changes, uh, franchise tax changes, and the property tax, uh, local property tax exemption increase. Both of those are revenue streams that help fund our public schools. So at the very time that we're talking about the need to perhaps increase our funding to public schools, we have decreased two specific funding streams that go to funding public education. Uh, and when you look at the margin tax in particular, I'm not sure about the responsible outcome of that in terms of what it's doing to the Texas economy. When you're talking about only one in 10 businesses apparently getting this uh, benefit and 33%, my understanding is, 33% of the businesses that are benefiting from this are out of state businesses. They're not even here in Texas. So we're letting them have this, uh, this tax cut to use in their state, which good for them there. But that's not necessarily helping Texas. So again, looking at the big picture, I think we have to look at all of these aspects of anything that we decide, any of the decisions we make, 
there are ripple effects, there are compounding effects, and it all makes a difference when you're looking at the big picture. And I think the point that you, both of you make is that <clears throat> writing a budget, a state budget, is a complex issue. It's not a simple matter, but I'm, for one, put a plug in for giving the legislature more discretion over spending rather than less because there are times when you need to cut back, you need to shift spending because of a need. And so maybe it's the bias of a former appropriator, but I believe there should be more discretion rather than less, and I think the state would be healthier for it. Do we have questions? We have a mic. We have a question down here at the front. And then we have one over here in the middle. Um, uh, Mr. Williams, earlier you were talking about funding the student rather than institution in K through 12 and higher ed. And I just wondered what you meant by funding the student. Uh, earlier you were talking about funding the student rather than funding the, the institution, the college, or the school in K through 12 and higher ed. And I just was wondering what you meant by funding the student specifically. Well, in, in higher education, uh, give the students so many credit hours. Uh, and we find out, like in Wash I'll use Washington State, for example. A student goes to the University of Washington and he transfers to Washington State University. The, co the courses aren't transferable for some reason. Uh, the university doesn't care if the kid graduates. Back a century ago, when I went to Penn State, when I went in as a freshman, they gave me a card with everything I needed to graduate with a business administration degree. And every time I registered, we had to check off that card. That doesn't happen today. Colleges don't care if a kid graduates or not, as long as they get the money. So if you funded the student, you'd suddenly turn your colleges into student-centered. And uh, former Governor Mitch Daniels became president of Purdue. His first day in the job, he sent a letter to the faculty saying, Purdue University is no longer faculty-centered. We're now student-centered. And last year, when a student entered Purdue, they guaranteed their tuition would not go up until they graduated. We need to really look at the waste in higher ed, particularly some of the things that could be contracted out. I have a question here. I'm concerned about basic infrastructure, water, roads, and bridges. Uh, the previous legislature, I believe they created a revolving fund for water projects. It's a limited fund. It requires competition among the, the areas of Texas that need help, and it also transfers the fiscal burden to the local entities because it's a, it's a loan, it's not a grant. Also, I'm appreciative of the additional funds that went into roads, uh, particularly one-time shot, but I also recall TxDOT saying after all that was identified that that wasn't adequate to meet the annual needs of maintenance and new roads based upon different numbers come out to 12 to 1,500 new Texans a day so my question is, since the, t since the title of the panel is, does conservative Texas budget meet the needs of Texas? Does the budget meet the needs of funding basic infrastructure on an annual basis, or are we going to fall back into a situation where we get so far behind that we have to have a large influx of money just to try to catch up? Anybody that wants to handle that? Yeah, I, I think, you know, that's, it's an interesting question. I don't know if I agree with the uh, entirety of the premise of the question. Uh, I think that uh, what the state has done with respect to water is actually pretty robust and is going to allow us to fund many, if not most, of the projects that we need. And that's part of a 50-year plan. And, and certainly we can... Uh, you know, have differences of opinion on that, but I think it is actually a, a very substantial investment that will meet hopefully most of the need that we have going forward, and the more critical aspect is really going to be execution of that. Uh, similarly with transportation, you add up the strategies that I listed, and in, in that's not a, a grant. That's several billion dollars a year going into the state highway fund. Uh, I'm not sure uh, you know, where your information is coming from. Maybe you're right, but I, I think that we are providing enough revenue for TxDOT moving forward. Now, I will uh, provide this caution, and that is that when you look at road capacity, 
Uh, what happens is as we expand capacity, utilization, it, it has been shown in many studies, will then increase to meet that capacity. It's important from an economic perspective because without that increased capacity, it can strangle our, our growth. And certainly we want to decrease congestion, uh, but don't be surprised if over the long term, as quickly as we expand our capacity, we have increased utilization, and that's good for local development and for economic growth, but we still wrestle with the problem of congestion. Uh, in regard to the, the $2 billion water development fund, the, the interesting thing that I'd like to say about that in regard to this panel and what I was thinking we're kind of talking about in terms of the budget itself, when we're talking about apples to apples or apples to oranges here, oftentimes the problem with us having these substantive, honest discussions with one another about the budget and about our differing opinions about what should be spent and how it should be spent is we we are comparing things that have nuances in them that we haven't identified. So for instance, the $2 billion that came out of the Economic Stabilization Fund that went to the Water Development Fund was counted toward that base budget that year, a one-time $2 billion expense. And that's going to have an impact on what our base is, from which we're going to project what the next budget is. We have a lot of things that, like that that happen over the years where we the 2006-2007 the decision about the property tax swap, $14 billion, that was going to impact th what's looked at in terms of your baseline budget there. When we had uh, federal ARA funds that we used uh, to plug some holes in our budget, and then we came back the next year and didn't have those one-time federal dollars, and we plugged in state dollars, we artificially, if you will, raised state spending to cover something that we had used one-time dollars for. I mean, these are the reasons why it's so hard to have an honest discussion about these things without having to go into depth about all the numbers. And I don't know how we can do that without spending a whole lot of time and energy on, on, on putting all this stuff together and everybody reading it. I don't know. But the fact is that without us doing that, then we're not really talking about the same information, and we need to do that, I think, to get to the common place. Now, let me just say about transportation. The House, again, I don't know if Greg would uh, agree with this or not, but the House did have $1.5 billion appropriated for transportation. Appropriated. Not a, not a gimmick, not coming back to you and saying, let's have a constitutional amendment that will shift something around here or there because we don't want to have to make the decision. You elected us to, but we don't want to have to make that decision. We're going to punt it back to you. We actually appropriated in our budget an additional $1.5 billion. That did not come out in the final budget. That was eliminated. And what instead came out was the constitutional amendment, Prop 7, that you guys voted on, hopefully. I voted for it. It was the only option we have and we passed it. And as you heard uh, in the summary that, that uh, Dr. Bonin gave, there will be additional monies coming in beginning in 2018 from the sales tax and additional money in 2020 from the motor vehicles tax. Nothing for the next several years, mind you. We're, this is down the road when that's gonna happen. And that's essentially skimming money off of the top that is part of growth that we use to pay for the growth in this state. So we're, again, as Talmadge keeps talking about, we're dedicating more money that we will have no discretion over, further tying the hands of the legislature to fund transportation instead of outright appropriating what might be needed. And in the proposition you voted on last session, that last cycle, uh, that allowed oil and gas severance taxes to be split between the Economic Stabilization Fund and the Highway Fund. We passed that. We've, we've already seen there's an erosion in the money coming in there because of the volatility of the oil and gas industry. So we're, we're making some headway. We're doing some things that are necessary for that infrastructure. But we're still kicking the can down the road on a lot of it. We're still not appropriating the money that's necessary for this. We've been relying on debt, as Greg mentioned, for a long time to fund transportation. And so what we have now, in my opinion, is not adequate because we're not meeting what TxDOT has told us is the amount that's needed to maintain current levels of congestion. 
Bobby, you had a question. Well, I think the, the point you bring up reminds me of pensions. It's kick the can forward. There's no real attempt to look at what is needed for infrastructure. And the Volcker Alliance recommends that every state take a deep look at what the cost is to bring the roads, the bridges, the buildings, the other infrastructure up to par. And I don't know of any state that has really looked at that. And then once you do that, then what are some of the ways the private sector can get involved and help you on that? But you, you brought up a real problem. And that's why it should be disclosed in the budgets. Would you please uh, help me thank the panel uh, for their comments today? Our discussions will continue. Representative Howard and I will continue to talk about plus and times for the metric of the uh, increase, and we'll do that at a different time.